Welcome to Dispatches from the Front. Um, my guest today is Detective Constable John of the Metropolitan Police. And John has been a specialist in child abuse matters. And uh, for our audience, I have to say, he, he has some really incredible things to say um, about uh, what he's experienced and uh, some of the procedures that he's encountered within the Met Police. So, John, welcome. Thank you. Um, it's good to have you here in the UK Column studio after all this time. Um, just start somewhere at the beginning. Just tell us a little bit about yourself and just when did you become a policeman and uh, what, what sort of things have you done before you got near the child protection issues? Well, I, I joined the police in the beginning of the 1990s. Um, my early career was just as a uniform officer. And... Um, I sort of soon progressed quickly into the, the CID department and uh, all was going well without incident. And then I moved on to a specialist operation which was tracking down transient paedophiles because the Sex Offenders Registry, Registry Act had been brought in in 1997 and they were finding that a lot of sex offenders were, were going off the radar, were going missing. So um, I was asked to... Uh, front part of uh, the Met's effort into tracking down some of the transient paedophiles. Um, that was, you know, it was an honour to do it and it was a good little role. But things started to sort of um, go awry with it because there was um, two sex offenders, which my, my remit was the inland waterways of London, but it soon spread to a national basis. And they... they had information that um, sex offenders were uh, coming out of prison after conviction, caution or serving a sentence for what they call a Schedule 1 sexual offence, were required to sign uh, the sex offenders register and just go missing. But they would go in to live on canal boats. Uh, they said, we, we've got two. We think there's probably a couple more. You're on it for the next few months. See if you can, you know, double the figures and find two more. Well, what happened was within a few months I'd found 90 and with that sort of exposed that there was a loophole in the law that allowed people to live on canal boats, avoid registry, and, and just act with impunity. So, so these people could have anonymous lives, effectively. Um, they, they're there living in an area, uh, but because they're on a boat, they don't have to identify themselves. They're not on the uh, um, council register. Nothing. They, they, Electoral they, register, yeah. Yeah, they, they were, uh, you know basically living like a free life and uh, no one knew where they were, what they were doing or anything. But there's quite a few factors that were involved. The one is that there's quite a lot back then was like a hippie alternative community. There was a bit of an anti-police vibe to it. Um, and if you're a fellow boater, as it were, you was instantly liked and welcomed by this community. But the community, actually, some of them didn't realise who they were having living next door to them. And on a few occasions, um, some of these people were... were pulling up into the, uh, a boating community and there was children there and they were offering to act as babysitters and things like that, you know, and there were some dangerous sex offenders there. And um, the, the canal system back then, you know, no one ever went there. They, uh, you know, it was sort of basically out the remit. But canals are so old that they sort of um, transgressed boundary borders. So the Registry Act said that you had to register as a sex offender within the police district where you resided within 28 days. But some of these canals, they actually straddled police districts. On some occasions, three or four districts would merge at one area. So you could be living on a canal boat, and on your 27th day, you move to the other side of the bank, and then you get another 28 days. And not only that, kids are attracted to canals. And also, back then, there was a programme called Rosie and Jim, just remind me when you're talking, what We're date? We're talking about sort of late 90s now, right. late 90s, early 2000. And there was a, a children's programme, Rosie and Jim, and it, it was sort of like glamorising life on a canal, and, and it's not a bad life, but, you know, these people were, were living on there and no-one knew where they were or what they were doing. And what happened then was that it highlighted what was going on and started getting a lot of national interest from national crime agencies and start getting a lot of help from what used to be the National Crime Squad and um, also the Scotland Yards Paedophile Unit. 
we were working jointly because of the successes I was having. And I can always remember a, a corridor conversation, as we call it, by a very seasoned, experienced uh, paedophile unit detective, a real good man, and he drags me to one side and he said, you know, it's a bizarre world because in any form of policing, when you get too good at your job, you get promoted and you get looked after. In this game, when it involves those high up, and by that he was meaning politicians, people and the upper echelons of society, he said, it's a problem. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I'm hearing your name mentioned in a lot of places now. He said, you're getting a bit too good at what you're doing. He said, you've got to be very, very careful, son. And I said, well, why? Why is it like that? And he turned around to me and he said, right. He said, on two occasions, we had Leon Britton, the MP, Tory MP, we had him bang to rights. And on both occasions, the funding was pulled. He said, they will do the same to you. Well, the odd thing happened was that, I mean, I knew who Leon Britton was, but I, I, I had no interest in politics or anything like that back in them days. And... Um, I can even remember asking, like my mum, I said, you know, Leon Britton, is, is he, you know, a man of any note? And she said, well, I know he's an MP. I said, well, all right, I didn't really say much. And uh, literally two weeks after that, I get called into a senior officer's uh, room. He said, come and see me, come and see me. What, what sort of rank officer would that we, be? We're talking uh, chief inspector at the time. Um, but it was a small unit, so chief inspector was quite senior, really, you know. Um, and he said, look, I'm sorry to say it, he said, but um, we're, we're, we're withdrawing you from the operation. I said, but why? He said, look, I can't tell you, but it's come from high up. It's being shut down. And I thought, well, I was a bit confused. I said, but that's, that's unfair. You know, this is, this is really going places. And he said, look, you're going to be commended and you can have any job you want. Don't worry about it. We're, we've been told to look after you, but unfortunately it's out of my hands. It's been pulled. So they were shutting down all of the work in relation to paedophiles living in this canal network. Yeah, and I was the only sort of national steer. It was me. I was the focal point. And I was getting inquiries from all over the world, coming from the Falkland Islands, the Channel Islands, a lot of the islands, funny enough. Um, but everywhere they were coming in, you know, reports of sex offenders on boats. It was it was just getting... It was going stupid. It was just mushrooming. And, and I just couldn't get it. But then this fella's words resonated with me. And I was a bit, I was disgusted with it, to be honest, and I couldn't get any answers, no answers at all. And it was the, the fellas that were working on the support side of it, they were, they were really apologetic and upset, and they said, look, there's nothing we could do about it. So I said, well, I'm not staying, I'm leaving. So I left, and I got a job with, it was, you know, it was quite an elite little unit. It was the, uh, the police's clubs and vice unit. And the clubs and vice, they had the uh, the governance for anything to do with vice, whether it be prostitution or gambling, but also for a lot of the, the main licences for the big nightclubs, because London is like the club in central, you know, for, for Europe. Um, so I went on to this job, and I was uh, I got a job with what they call the, the Street Offences Unit. And Street Offences relates to the old Street Offences Act of the last century, which refers to prostitution, street prostitution. And our job was to go and, and sort of arrest street prostitutes, really. But also, we had governance for juveniles. So if a juvenile was found on the street in a red light area late at night, believed involved in it, they were to be sort of brought in, taken into protective custody. And every now and then, um, a child would be found, usually a girl. And our job was to then bring her in, inform social services, the kid would then be placed into protective police custody while social services work out emergency protection orders, EPOs. What, what sort of age for the girls then? At 14, you know. It was. It tended to be under 17. The, the law was a bit... The, the law prior to the Im implementation of the amended sex offender... Um, I forget what it's called now, not sex offenders. It, it's to do with uh, child sexual offences, but... Uh, it'll, It'll come to me, the Sexual Offences Act, I think, it got amended in 2003, was quite complicated, you know, and it, and it was going back to... It was gender-specific as well, so offences against boys were different against offences against girls. And Anyway, so we would, we would find these, these kids and take them into custody and everything else. But the problem then was that it was a competitive environment, so it was number-crunching, so you were given a target 
of each car that was put out, three cars were put out per night, and you would have a competition who could arrest as many prostitutes as you can. And 10 would be a good figure. And if you did that every day of the week, you was the top team. So there was competitions. And you could process a prostitute very quickly via the custody. And it, it was pointless because all of them were drug addicts. All of them had come from the care system. And if you brought a kid in, that was your night finished. The car was taken off the road uh, and that was it so that you wouldn't get the figures. So you just encouraged not to deal with them. Right. That, that's, that is a very interesting comment, isn't it, for people who look to the police to be... Uh, protecting the weak and vulnerable in society. And you're saying that the regime to get the, the targets for the prostitutes means that vulnerable children were... We don't, want, we don't want to take them. Well, it is. I mean, it's shocking because if you think about it, if, if a man has sex with a prostitute, it's the woman who commits the offence, right? But that's, that's a woman of consent in age. If someone has sex with a child, that's rape, and you're talking a major crime offence. You're talking an offence that carries a life tariff, yet they're, they're committing major crime, and you, you're sort of dissuaded from dealing with it. And I remember bringing one little girl in. She was 14, oh, around about 14, and a lot of these kids were undernourished, and they were heavily infected with diseases like hepatitis C, some of HIV and things like that, you know. And so they look younger than their age. And one young girl brought in, she had scabies due to her lifestyle. And the moaning that they gave me for bringing the girl in because they said the car will now, now need to be cleaned, the room that you take them to will now need to be fumigated. The girl's a pain in the arse because she's always shouting and screaming, and, you know, and it's pointless anyway because she'll be back out tomorrow. So there, there was, it was appalling, really. It was, you know, and what they said, if you see them again, just tell her to, to do one to get out of here. Right, and and this was being told to all the police. It wasn't just yourself. Anybody who was involved in this type yeah. of work was told this. That was told. Yeah, that yeah. that was that was the role, the unwritten role. Right, and um, so then they've dealt with it. But what what happened was there was information from the moment I came in regarding one particular woman, and her name her name was Foxy. Her street name was Foxy, and she was a larger than life character. And she was a street prostitute, but she was rumoured to be pimping out young girls. And I'd heard the rumours from the moment I walked in the office, but nothing was ever done about this woman. Anyway, I, I sort of got moved on merit. I did very well on the street. Um, and What I, was your rank then? Uh, detective, right. you know. Um, and I was chosen to go on to quite an elite little unit, not dealing with vice, it was dealing with other stuff, more organised crime. And I went on to that, and I did incredibly well, but then I was asked to come back to vice and to uh, be the senior investigating officer in an allegation of child prostitution. So, um, but by that time, I think what we need to establish as well is that from 2000, I had been a lone parent of four children. I'd been left to bring up four children. And the relevance will become apparent, you know, shortly. So not only was I then asked to work again back with the children, I was now looking after children of my own. As, and, you know, they were all at that time under 10 and one was an infant. So it was a bit hard going for me. And the hours were irregular. And, you know, childcare was a bit of a nightmare, especially if you're dealing with kids, being taken in care orders. You know, your day could be a long one. But... You know, I was sort of told, look, you know, we'd like you to go on it. So I did it. And it was a young girl called Zoe. And Zoe had, um, she was, I think, about 14 or something like that. Again, very young looking for her age. So Zoe looked about 12. And she'd made an allegation that this woman, Foxy, had been pimping her out. And she'd made a couple of allegations and they hadn't gone anywhere. So what I was told was, look, can you look into it? She's made allegations before. She's a bit of a nightmare. She might be lying. She might not. But she's a bit persistent. See what you can do. So I went, OK. So I uh, I went to see the girl, made an appointment, and was told she's very anti-police, you know, and she is a bit of a handful. So I went with a colleague. To, uh, they made the introduction, introduced me to this girl, and... You know, and what I used to do was, I was good with the kids, so I would sit down and I'd just start doodling or drawing or something like that, engaging them, and then ice-breaking stuff, and then 
the conversation, the narrative begins. Anyway, um, we started chatting and everything else, and she turned around to me, she said, you know, you're different to all the others. I went, well, that's all right. You know, I don't mean to, you know, and I wouldn't even dress like the other couples. I just, I was always a uh, scruff bag, really. You know, I, I hated wearing a suit, you know, and I liked the street. I was good on the street, you know. And uh, and, and she said, you know, I like you. I, I'm happy to talk to you. I said, okay, well, let's do it properly then. She said, yeah, all right. So we had an agreement, we shook hands. We made an appointment to do a proper, what they call an ABE interview, which is like a video recorded interview. And... Um, we sat down, we had a chat, we, we, we interviewed her, and, and she told me the story start to finish. And she's the uh, product of a um, broken family, the mother was a drug addict, the, the father was absent, and it, the mother was buying drugs off this girl Foxy, and Foxy then started to groom her, because the mother was unable to look after her. She then ended up living with the grandparents, but the grandparents lived in a red light area. And so Foxy would go and pick this young girl up and a basic grooming, look after her, show her some attention, a bit of love, do her hair for her, give her makeup, but then introduce her to cannabis, got smoking cannabis, and then would then take her to hotels. These were bottom end hotels. These were the sort of places where a lot of the builders would go to, you know. So there'll be like converted uh, Victorian houses or whatever. In one, one area of London, there's a big row of them. And a lot of them were, were maintenance and building works from the north would come down to stay in these hotels. So Foxy had an agreement with the night porters, and the night porters would make a room available for her, so she would take her clients in there. So she'd go in there with her client, start having sex and have this young girl there watching, and then encourage the young girl to get involved. And then from there, she would then start giving the young girl the bigger drugs, so that the Class A drugs is what they want the kids on. Once they got them on the Class A drugs, especially the crack cocaine, it's got a, a real grip on them, you know? And this girl had no re no way of getting these drugs, so she relied on Foxy as her medicine lady, you know? So she got her on crack cocaine, and then she started then pimping the young girl out, getting the young girl involved. And then she would then get the uh, girl to introduce her friends to it, so she was then introducing her friends. Also come from families that parents were drug addicts or absent or whatever, and so, or in the care system. In fact, all the kids we dealt with were subject to care orders, whether they were residential care orders or, or just normal care orders, you know. But they're all known to social services and from at-risk backgrounds. And so she gave me the name of another kid. So I went to see that girl. The story was identical. And the other thing was, I used to say, well, what about the police? Did the police ever get involved? And both girls said, well we would get hidden in a bush. If we was put on the street, if the police came, Foxy would hide us in a bush. But she she knew the coppers anyway. She'd just flirt with them and they would just let her go. And she said, but also there's a judge. There's a judge involved. I said, what do you mean? She went, oh, judge at the, the magistrate's call. So when Foxy's charged and goes for the judge, the judge is her client anyway. So the judge lets her off. So I checked this out. I went through the, the, the disposal history, the criminal history of this girl, and found she keeps getting bind-overs, this Foxy. So I thought, right, well, there's something in this. So all of a sudden, these girls then introduced me to other girls who introduced me to other girls, and these ages went down to nine years old. Right. And, you know, some came from traveller sites, uh, some actually came from the residential care homes, and there was no-one looking out for them, and these kids were known to the police because... They were regular absconders from care. And uh, they were regularly found in red light areas and no one had actually pieced any of this together. So I started to uh, pull it all together. The intelligence was just flowing and information was coming in from drug dealers on the street. They were also concerned about it. And also other prostitutes were coming forward and talking to us, you know, and saying, you know, this is what's happening. I then got approached by a social worker, a senior social worker, and at the time this this operation, this line of work was mainly in Westminster, and it started spiralling out to, to the outer boroughs of London and into the provinces. And this was from Croydon, and the social worker said, look, we've got a big problem down in Croydon. And my inquiries did then start to lead to Croydon. And, and the significance of this is that it's now moving into areas of a better class of person. Is that what it means? Well, well, 
what what you're saying at first it was central London because there is a transient population and people don't tend to live there they just work there and when when they're working away from home a bit like someone going to Thailand they will commit a crime like you know of, of soliciting a prostitute or whatever because they've got the anonymity of being a tourist but when they live in an area there's a different mindset so it's going into an area that is more residential and yeah I would say some of the areas were bad areas they were bad areas and I think most of them had their own social problems but there was a lot of residential kids homes in these outer boroughs and a lot of kids would be farmed out and the kids would network you know so if a kid was taken into into a secure unit for whatever reason they would go in there and they would network with other kids and the main way of earning money was either through through violent crime robbery or with the girls it was prostitution so these networks were all set up you know and no one was looking there was no one looking into them at all Anyway, a social worker from Croydon said, you know, we've got a problem. I said, OK. And he said, look, we have meetings regularly about certain girls. She said, I'll give you a list of these girls, and they are in trouble. And one girl, she had such infection inside inside her that she would regularly pass blood and and all sorts of, you know, nastiness would come out because she had active cysts inside her through, through prostitution. And she was a young kid, you know. She said, if something's not done, this girl's going to die. She's being pimped out. She's she's on her knees, this girl, you know. She said, but we invite the police along. We invite the police. We have been doing it for nearly 10 years, and each time they refuse. I said, well, who are you inviting? They said, well, your unit, the vice unit. We've invited them so many times, they know about this. So I then went back in the records, and I went back 10 years, and I went back through all the records of kids found in red light areas over the last 10 years, and, yeah, there, it, there was rights. And I was contacting some of these kids, who are now adults. And, they, and I said, well, what was happening? They said, well, if the police found us, they told us, tell us to do one, get out of here. Um, oh, well, they just ignore us. They, they knew we were being pimped out. I said, did anyone get taken in for it? And they said, no, no, we were doing it all the time. So it had been going on historically, and the unit had known about it. So how, how long had it been going on from for? From the time I was on there, I'd gone back 10 years, and it had gone back further than that. Right, and these were these were in select red light areas, uh, Kings Cross, Islington, um, Westminster, all in London, you know, and they were the main ones where the kids were were being worked. But now Croydon was coming to know, but the police knew about Croydon as well, you know. So these areas, it wasn't any any news, you know. But then what you've also got is missing persons unit. So um, someone goes missing. A missing person unit would be appointed to look into, you know, uh, what's happened to them when they are investigated. But every time a child comes back late or, or fails to attend uh, a kid's home curfew, which will be an unreasonable hour, say like 9 o'clock, 8 o'clock, they don't turn up, the police are called, a form's filmed out, and it's just a process because these kids do come back. And uh, so these missing persons, they knew about them. They knew about these kids, and they were just seen as, as a nuisance. It was just a routine, oh, so-and-so's gone missing again. They'll be back tomorrow. But, and they, they fill out the form. They call it ACE, Arse Covering Exercise. And it's the only reason they do it. No one looks into the, 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 the reasons why these kids are going missing. So I drafted up a report. It was factually based. It was concise. Um, and and it, had evidence, it had evidence backing it. And it was a small, it was a pricey of a report, and it was just highlighting the extent, the sheer extent of the problem, the history behind the problem, uh, the results of the problem, the fact that the kids are suffering and they're also grooming other kids into it is self-perpetuating monster. And and I just put a few of the opinions, you know, the factual opinions of the social workers. And and in that report, were you also were you also highlighting the fact that the police were not acting as they should, or police yeah, con- yeah, police I, officers had hadn't acted? I mean, what, what I did was I, I was always mindful of the fact that I'll never reinvent the wheel, and I'm no better than anyone else. So I don't want to criticise a colleague. But what I put in, these kids were known to the police. They, these investigations were never followed up for whatever rationale. So I, I didn't criticise anyone, but it has to be noted that this isn't a new thing. This has been known about, but I also mentioned the fact that there are allegations involving a judge and that, that other police officers are aware. And there was also um, someone 
connected to the, the music department of the BBC was involved, a, a manager of, of that. So, you know, and anyway, that went in. And I thought, right, well, they've been made aware now. And I would always put reports on, for whatever reason, reports would go on, intelligence reports. Police works on intelligence. And I then get a phone call within about an hour of the report going through. And it's from the governing detective inspector. And he said to me, John, uh, uh, about this report you put on, I was thinking, good, brilliant. You know, I've now shown them the goose that is giving the golden eggs and hopefully this will move forward, you know. I really thought I was going to get praise for it. And then what happened was he said, uh, we need to talk now. Get in my office now. I went, OK. So I went down to see him. I was in a different building. I travelled down, went in his office. And it was like someone had set a pit bull on me. Started swearing and shouting and what have you done? You can't do things like this. I'm taking, he's shutting it down. I'm taking you off. So he withdrew me straight away from the operation and that really upset me, you know, because I was moving forward, you know. And I thought, well, if I go, who else is going to, you know, no one can ever do the job as good as you do it. Do you know what I mean? And looking back on it, I did a good job, whereas others hadn't. And I don't want to be conceited, but that's what happened, you know. And, um, I, d I was mortified, absolutely mortified. What, what was in your head about why you'd got this response? You thought you were going to be praised for it. You get attacked by a pit bull. Yeah. Well, what, why did you think it was? Well, well I mean, it, it, it was it was some sort of weird sort of cognitive distortion because he, he turned around and said that, that we had known about this and the reason the kids are talking to you now was because they were dealt with properly 10 years ago and they're now happy to come forward and talk to you. Nothing to do with my good work. It was to do with the good work of other officers before me. And, and it, it was just absolute dire nonsense. And I was just confused. I was, I was literally totally confused. But it was done with such aggression. And what we used to call it in the police was a hairdryer, an old school shouting thing, you know, screaming and shouting. And I walked away really licking my wounds and scratching my head. So um, I, didn't, I thought, what? So I, I, I didn't go back to work. I thought, what the hell's going on? I said, never went back to work the next day. And anyway, I get a phone call, um, and it was from the the high up boss, the, the detective chief superintendent of the unit. And he said, uh, John, what's gone on? I said, well, I don't know. I'm a bit confused. He went, we need to have a chat. I said, OK. He said, well, don't rush back to work. Have the summer on me. And it was the summer. Take your kids away. What what date is this now? This was this was we're talking about I think about two thousand and four around that time, and this was in the summer, beginning of the summer, and he said, "Well, have the summer on me, you know, go away with your kids, take your kids away." So he's aware of my family situation. He said, "I know, you know, it's tough for you. Go away, and when you get back, when you're ready, let's sort all this out. It's not going to be a problem." And I'm going to be honest now. I like the fella. He was a nice bloke. He was a nice bloke. And so I said, really? He went, yeah, 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 don't worry about it. It trivialised everything. So anyway, I came back, and but it was on my mind all the time because, you know, the, these kids weren't, they, they were get, weren't getting served anymore. They, there was no one there for these kids, you know. And they relied on you. They relied on you for protection, and, and they wanted to win. They wanted, because also behind this was organised criminality. The girl that was running it, she was backed up by some very, very serious gangsters and it re resulted in me getting credible death threats and everything. These, you know, There was money at stake here, there was a livelihood for these people and they were connected gangsters, you know. And these kids were scared and these kids, some of these kids, if they went back home, they went back to the ghettos where these people were operating and they were petrified. So um, I, uh, I came back to work and sure enough, the... the Boss calls me in, and I said to him, no, I'm not talking to you on my own, I want someone with me. So I, I got a representative from the Human Resources Department, personnel came, sat down, and he said to me, John, well, what, what's gone on? Made me a cup of tea. I said, well, I'll only talk to you if I can be honest. He said, well, yeah, that goes both ways. I said, OK. I said, well, what have I done? I said, I've, you know, I really thought I'd done well, I'd exposed this, I'd done this, I'd done this. And he turned around to me and said, well, that's a problem. You've exposed it. He said, we knew you could dig, but we never knew you could dig that deep. And he then said, what you've exposed is going to F us past, present and future. 
This cannot and will not ever get out. He said, if you mention a word of this, you will be thrown to the wolves. He then said, you will lose everything, and that means your job, your home, your kids, you will lose it all. You need to shut your effing mouth. And I was just dumbstruck. I was like, for real? And he said, we never thought you would dig this deep. You have no understanding how deep this goes. So you're, <coughs> excuse me, you're a dis- detective constable, so one would have thought in your job, somebody who was professionally good at their job would be good at digging. You dig, you absolutely start to see what's going on. And then I'm just going to use the phrase, these people, these people are so confident that they threaten you point blank in a room. With a witness. With a witness. With a witness, yeah. Um, At the time, my youngest boy was still quite young and I was petrified. I'd have my kids taken off me. I really thought I'd cross the mafia. And you're right, it was the confidence, the way it was portrayed against me. And the other thing, which was very bizarre, he said, he said, how do you think you've been treated? Do you think you've been bullied? I went, you're damn right I've been bullied. He said, you have. You've been bullied. He said, there's a form to fill out, a fairness at work form. I'm instructing you to get it now and fill it out. And, and, and the police is absolutely awash with this form. It's just forms for everything. And he told me the number of the form. He said, you fill it out, you put exactly what's gone on. You've got to do that, son. I said, oh, I will. You know, I will. And he said, and then do you know what happened to it? I went, well, it will go somewhere and get investigated. He said, no, I'll tell you what happened. He said, all those that you've mentioned will be brought in and they will be interviewed. I said, right, OK, good, good. That's brilliant. He said, and then it will come to me to be ratified. He said, and do you know what I'll do with it? I said, well, you pass it on to, you know, the corruption command or something, I don't know. He said, well, not really. And he points to a bin. He'll go, go in that bin. And it will stay in that bin. He said, I will never betray, betray fellow rank and nor will they. You've no idea what you're up against. Shut your effing mouth. And he got my hand and he, and he said, you've got to give me your, a gentleman's agreement now. You never, ever look into child prostitution ever again. Now, what, what happened then, Brian, was I left there totally, totally uh, frightened, really frightened. And that, that was a, a bit of a, a spiral downhill for me. And then over the, the, the coming years, I left that unit. I left straight away and I said to him, I can't work under you. Yeah, so the, the, these are colleagues that you're doing a difficult and you're doing a dangerous job out on the ground and you rely on the backing of your police colleagues to actually protect you against people who are uh, organised crime. Why don't they go for you? Because they know if they go for you, you're going to be protected by the police. And here are your police colleagues simply turning around and threatening you in the same way. Which is vicious. Vicious, and it, and it is a conspiracy. And, I mean, conspiracies exist in law. You can conspire yeah. to commit murder. You can, it's, it's in statute law. It, it's a criminal offence. It's a criminal offence. Conspiracy is... So, you know, when people go, bandits, conspiracy theorists, there's no theory about it. This is conspiracy reality. And, and I was in the centre of a very horrible conspiracy. And so frightened, I couldn't tell anyone. I generally thought they would come for me and come for my children. And the other thing is, I've seen firsthand what the care system is and there's nothing caring about it you know it is a paedophile's playground these kids get and the other thing is i was working with informants and a lot of these informants have been in the care system and one of them's turned around to me and said whatever you do you never let your children go into care because what will happen is if you ain't there they one one of my kids was a little bit he was a little bit behind with things and i used to tell this bloke he said they'll go for him straight away they will get it don't ever lay in bed thinking they won't get it. They will get it. And by get it, you know, you, you, know, you know what I mean. And, uh, so right, so, so what, what happens now then? So you've been threatened? Well, what, what happens now is I say I can't work under you. So I leave and I go on to a child abuse unit and I end up in North London, a very busy part of North London. And I start on this unit and they're investigating child abuse. And I'm in there and I get approached by a detective sergeant and said, look, as well as being an investigator, do you want to take on an additional role? I said, well, like what? They said, well, there's all sorts of things you can do. Um, I said, is there one to do with um, a liaison with children's homes? I went, yeah, 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 there is. The, the girl left two years ago. I said, was there any issues with, with, with it? And she said, no, 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 no issues. It's an easy number. You'll get given a day here and there to go and deal with it. There'll be a odd meeting, but over two years, she never had any issues at all. 
So did child prostitution ever crop up? Oh, no, 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 we don't get any of that. Well, OK, and this was a borough, the London borough of Haringey. Now, Haringey has the most amount of kids' home of any sort of local authority in the country. I think it was about 22 to 26 care homes for a small London borough. Anyway, so I was given assurances that it weren't a problem. So I picked up the phone and I asked for a list of all the care homes from social services. So they faxed it through because the police didn't have a copy of it. It came through and it had the phone numbers and I rang, I rang them up. First, and I said, this is so-and-so care home. I went, yeah, I said, I told them who I was. I said, nothing to worry about, but this is what I'm looking into. But I went, oh, right. I said, how many children you got? And they said, about five. So how many do you lose at a weekend to crime? And I'm on about prostitution and things like that. He went, oh, three. I went, you what? I said, what? He said, yeah, they usually go missing on a Thursday and come back on a Monday. I said, do you, do you think they're involved in, in prostitution? Oh, no, we know they are. I went, right, well, has the police ever been to speak to you about it? He went, no, the police come and pick up the missing persons form, but the kids come back. I said, well, what are the kids like? She said... Oh, they're in the right state, some of them. Some of them are bleeding, some of them are so high on drugs. We know that come Wednesday, they're going to be kicking off because they've not had their drugs. They've all got money on them, you know. And I said, oh, my God. So that was like real time. So all of a sudden, I've got three kids within six minutes. By the end of three days, I'd found 50 children. 50 children. So I held a strategy meeting and I brought in the social services I brought in... Uh, this is Haringey Social... Haringey, Haringey Social Services. I think Hackney might have turned up, neighbouring boroughs, you know. Um, and then, because you get an overspill sometimes. I then I had a representative for uh, who dealt with child trafficking for Bernardo's. I had connections, a lot of these youth NGO groups came. There was a lot of people there. And, and I laid out my my uh, plan and I, I worked out a formula of how to deal with it using a simple act and the Children's Act and a section of the Children's Act relating to taking a child out of care at an unreasonable hour. And I'd done my research and I was just attacked, firstly by a head of social services who started screaming at me saying, what have you done to us? There's 50 care plans we've now got implemented because of you. I said, but you must have known about these kids. I went, yeah, but they didn't come to notice, so we weren't bothered. I said, well, they're making money, they're, you know. And, and um, he said, well, we've got so much work to do, you've created an absolute nightmare for us, you're a headache. Uh, so that was made clear that I wouldn't get much help from them. And then Bernardo's, the, the woman in charge of, of that unit for Bernardo's, she then um, turned around and said, you're treading on toes, you know for a fact that a child will never betray their pimp. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, you'll never prove it because the kids won't, you know, that's their source of money. I said, well, I know that. That's why I'm going on this other uh, statute law that will give me a power to search and seize property and everything. And they went, well, you can't just do that. There's a protocol here. There is an officer, a senior officer, who I'll be reporting you to because they're already dealing with it. I went, well, who's that? So he mentioned this name. I, by senior officer, she meant a senior police officer. Senior police officer, yeah, who wasn't vice. Now, vice had governance for that. This was some other man. And they said, we, there is an operation running. I said, well, I need to talk to this man. And she placed 20 actions on me to complete before I did any work. And each action could take me days. So, said, sorry, who placed those actions on th you? This was Bernardo's, because this, this, it, was, it was a partnership work. And when you deal with children, it's all working together, you know. And I was absolutely f flabbergasted what was going on. And um, so I, I spoke to my inspector and he said, well, just crack on. Don't worry about it. Crack on and, and do what you've got to do. So the next day I went out and I got a result straight away. I got a girl that was being pimped out and I got a pimp and it worked. So then I get a call from this high-ranking officer who is his chief superintendent. So I have to go up to one of the police buildings and he said, just treading on toes, get it back off. We've got an officer dealing with this. I said, well, dealing with what? Prostitution of children in care homes for London. We've got it under wraps. And I said, well, who is it? So he gave me the name of this girl, and I called her. And she said, it's a load of crap. She said, I've, uh, I've been to a meeting, but I've never dealt with any victims. And, I, and I, how can I nick? She said, it's just me. I don't even know where these kids' homes are. I've not even visited one. I said, so you're not investigating? She said, no, how can I? So it was a load of lies. So that was shut down, right? Then, lo and behold, I moved. And then I get a call 
that the girl that was at the the Zoe, the young girl that was at the centre of the other operation, was found dead on the street in a suspicious overdose. Just found dumped in the street dead. How old? Just remind us. By the... this time, I think she was getting on for 15, 16, something around right. that area. You know, She'd, a year or so had passed. So a 15-year-old Still, girl's yeah. just, just found dead. Key, in key witness to, to this case, dumped on the street. Um, and then it, it just absolutely it destroyed me, you know, and they never investigated another case of child prostitution. The vice unit never did. Um, what happened then was I left... Um, I'd got moved, so I ended up having to deal with other sorts of crime involving children, but was never dragged back into that area. Um, I shut my mouth for quite a while. Um, and then what happened was a Jimmy Savile scandal broke. And I thought, my God, it's not just me, there's others. And then Clive Driscoll came forward. And then um, Lenny Harper from uh, the States of Jersey Police, you know, the senior officer there, he he was running the care home uh, inquiry in Hope de la Green in Jersey. And it gave me better hope. But then that was shut down. And I can remember him on telly saying that it's now uh, coconut. They've the lab report saying the bones they've seized are coconut and not bone. And I'm thinking, it's been a cover-up. Um, so I then came forward. About 2014, I went to, the, uh, went to my inspector first and said, look, I need to talk to someone. I want to make an allegation of, of serious corruption there involving child prostitution cover-ups, and he totally dismissed it. So I then went to the corruption command and I said, I need to speak to someone very, very senior. It has to be a detective and it has to be a woman. And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, I don't know. Women won't roll their trouser legs up, meaning a Masonic link, because without entering into the conspiracy realm again, Masonry does have a big strong hold in the police. It has a hold in the police, but then when you uh, become a detective, it, it intensifies. And when you're a detective on a specialist role, it is almost like a stick of rock, Masonry through it, you know. I'm not knocking it. I work with many of them. I've not got an issue with them, but it is another allegiance that you don't need. Just you know? given a detached viewpoint, it has an, has an impact. It does, without yeah. a doubt. And, anyone, and I'll tell you how much it has an impact. When... I went to a job agency to try and get work as uh, a, a civilian detective. I was told by the agency, um, have you been or are you a Mason? And I said, well, why are you asking that? He said, we cannot take anyone who is a, or has been a Mason. And I said, well, why is that? And they said, because it has ruined too many inquiries, and namely the Hillsborough inquiry was deliberately frustrated by the Masons, deliberately. According to this security according company? To, according to this, um, yeah, a recruitment. Yeah. Rec sorry, recruitment and, company. And that is their, their, one of the main ones for recruiting civilian investigators, and they, they their baseline is the first question they ask you, are you a Mason? Okay. So just sticking with what happened to you, so you decided right. you were right. going to right. whistle blow? I whistle blow, and I, I made an allegation against a senior officer who, since then had been promoted to one of the highest posts in the country, um, made the allegation, and I was assured that this will be taken in the most utmost seriousness, and don't worry, we will investigate it. So I said, OK. I then get informed by the Metropolitan Police Federation that I'm to be served with gross misconduct papers, no, misconduct papers. I said, well, what, what have I done? He said, uh, you've um, it dated protection violations. I said, well, I haven't violated anything. They said, well, don't worry, we're assured it'll be a management action. All right, OK. Then the, the police were dragging their heels over my allegations, so I, I pushed forward and they wouldn't reply to me. So I made a complaint to the IPCC, the Independent Police Complaints Commission. Uh, they said, we won't get involved. Then all of a sudden, my misconduct allegations have been elevated to gross misconduct. I'm like, really? Well, why? Well, I was told then, don't worry, we're going to look into it and it will be resolved. I then um, get put in touch with an MP called Simon Danchuk, who at the time was champion the ab abuse cover-ups. And you're seeing more and more cover-ups coming out. And one of the key ones was the Rotherham scandal. 
and there was a detective from, from Great Manchester Police called Maggie Oliver. And I was asked if I wouldn't mind being put in touch with Maggie Oliver. Her story is very similar to mine. So I met with Maggie Oliver and her story was strikingly similar. And what she said to me was, John, watch it. She said, have they served you misconduct papers yet? I said, yeah. She said, you'll get arrested next because that's what they did to me. You'll put before a tribunal, you'll get be found guilty and they will sack you. That's exactly what they did to me and that's what they'll do to you. They'll raid your house, they'll do everything. John, just tell us what, just really briefly, what, was her story you say it's strikingly similar was she, she dealing she, with children she was dealing with children from the care system in, in rotherham in uh south yorkshire i think and um well greater manchester she's come under the greater manchester you know uh, uh, policing district and it was young girls being groomed and pimped out by by asian uh, minicab firms everything else uh but these kids were also client with the you know the clientele were people that had a bit of money and everything else and she exposed it and she was bullied bullied into silence told to shut her mouth it's not a problem forget about it and it was exactly the same as what I was dealing with but on a provincial level and she's her bullying that she encountered was exactly the same as mine but she did get sacked she got required to resign um and she was stitched up and she was stitched up by Peter Fahey who was at the time the uh you know, Chief Constable of, of Great Manchester Police. And it was the, the, the similarities were striking. I then get put in touch with um, a man called Lenny Harper. And Lenny Harper had, had uh, exposed the um, child abuse uh, murder and, and, you know, sexual abuse scandal in the Hotel Green. And the other thing was that it had been covered by, you know, um, a really good friend and, 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 a, and a proper activist, Bill Maloney, you know, child abuse, and he'd been on his. So um, I got in touch with Lenny. So Lenny said, come on, come and see me. So I went up to see Lenny and he told me his story. And again, the similarities were absolutely unbelievable. So there's a, there's a template in operation here as to what happens to police officers that stand up and say there's a cover-up of child abuse. Yep, and... Also, that they are bullied so monumentally that some of these coppers are committing suicide. I then get asked to go to a whistleblowers forum in, in Parliament, and there's a chief, and a retired chief constable there called Tom Lloyd, of Cambridgeshire, and uh, he then hears my story and says, "Well, this is shocking, um, but you're not alone." And far that I get put in touch with uh, a detective sergeant from Hampshire who had exposed a kids' home inquiry, uh, child prostitution thing, in on the Isle of Wight. And he had been bullied to the point of almost suicide, and they'd arrested him again for minor data protection and other issues, and bullied him to the point of almost suicide. And he now campaigns for coppers that are suffering post-traumatic stress and suicidal. He's got a, right. a, an outreach group. And he then says, you know, there's so many coppers are, are topping themselves but this is what they will do they will ruin you john so i've got three coppers all of them that, are, that uncovered child abuse high level child abuse on all of them have, have been bullied monumentally to the point of virtual suicide you know and um and each one of them warned me warned me what would happen so i thought well this is outrageous the public need to know and the police and the ipcc kept covering it up refused to progress my allegation the IPCC even said if I wrote to them again, they wouldn't even open my letters. So I then took the matter to the Cabinet. I got in touch with the Policing and Crime Minister, Mike Penning, and said, you need to sit down with me. And he did. Fair play to him, he did. He said he was shocked and stunned at what I'm saying. He afforded me privilege. I then informed the police that I'd spoken to him, and then they tried to get me done again on discipline, gross misconduct for talking to a politician. And luckily, that got overturned because it was just a vicious attack, you know. Um, he then said, right, we will implement an independent inquiry into what's happened to you and to what's happening all told. Because I said there is an algorithm of bullying. And he... Did, can I, sorry to interject, did he, um, 
uh, did he acknowledge the, the extent of the child abuse, which is the heart of this matter? You'd obviously told him what you had discovered. Did he actually register that yeah, there was yeah. this happening? Well, well I, I told him. I said, this is massive. I said, the, the tentacles of this go right to the heart of the establishment. And this is causing the whole detriment to society and it's probably even influencing politics. And I said, and I've got um, evidence of that and I explained to him about the thing with Leon Britton. You know, and all the time it's coming out in the press that this man's innocent and everything else. But then Bernard Hogan held a commissioner of the Met Police turned around and refused to apologise to Lady Britton. So I'm thinking, well, maybe he knows something that I know. So Mike Pennin... Um, then stopped all contact with me. Uh, I was assured by his wife, he'll ring me, he'll update me, and I couldn't get hold of him at all. So um, the police then... I'd, I just want to say, this is the man whose sole responsibility is policing. Yeah, policing. And you are telling him of the cover-up of major crime involving children, young yeah. girls... And what he does is completely cuts you off. Well, what, what, what he said, I met him on quite a few occasions and I got brought to his parliament, uh, parliamentary office, his ministerial office, you know, and he's right next to Michael Gove. They, they share the same corridor. And I'm in there and he turned around to me and this is his exact words. He said, what concerns me most about this is the public perception when this gets out. And that's all he was worried about. You know, how is it going to look on the establishment when this goes out? But at the end of the day, I told him. And it, in it, to my opinion, uh, things might have changed. But as far as I'm aware, he's done nothing. He might surprise me yet, I'm not sure. But I've asked repeatedly for the investigation team to get in touch with me, and they haven't. Um, and and it, it, absolute nonsense, you know, that he come out with. Um, and then he said to me, I, I give you my assurances that Bernard Hogan Howe, who is a friend of mine, will be shocked when he finds out. So I said, well, are you going to tell him? He said, I will tell him. He will be told. And as far as I'm aware, he didn't never told him. So in the end, I went, so carried on back to work and everything else, and all of a sudden I found out that, that my allegations that were now um, sort of being ignored, the police's then uh, sort of investigation of me for data protection had gone from... Management action, minor misconduct, which I would have denied anyway because I did bugger all wrong. It went from that to misconduct to gross misconduct. Now they, they've sent a file to the CPS for an impending prosecution against me. And I thought, right, well, I've had enough of this. This is outrageous. So I, I said, I got hold of the commissioner. And I said to the commissioner, I wrote to him. This is Sir Bernard Sir Hogan. Sir Bernard Hogan And I said, you know... The man that I've made serious allegations against and which there was witnesses to this has been promoted, not only has been promoted, he's been promoted with royal assent and given the Queen, Queen's Police Medal two years after I made allegations. Now, the format is if you're under investigation for serious issues, you do not get promoted. Your career's on hold to it, it's sorted out. And I wanted then to get out of the police, but they wouldn't let me resign because I was placed under investigation. So I couldn't do anything. I said, you've hounded me, you've destroyed me, you've ruined me, yet I've done nothing wrong. Now you want to prosecute me? I said, I'll tell you what, you put me before a court and I will tell the world, because it will be public domain, that this is a vicious cover-up of a whistleblower for you know, hindering and covering up child prostitution. And I, and I told him everything, Bernard Hogan, I put everything in the letter, but all of a sudden, everything changed. All of a sudden, the senior management... Uh, the assistant commissioners, they're, they're behind me, they're no longer prosecuting me, they're, they're, they're trying to um, forward my early retirement and everything else. Um, but, the, you know, and other things they did was that they, um, they halved my pay without even telling me. They cut my pay in half. Right. And which is all things I was told would happen, would happen. Right, John, you, you were saying there that they're moving you towards um, early retirement. Yep which obviously is is of some comfort to you because you you still have to you still have to live and and you're entitled to a pension and everything yeah. from your time serving in the police what have they actually done to 
start to investigate the key thing well, of well, the well, massive cover-up of the it, abuse of children. It, it was quite funny because in 2012, I was in Scotland Yard and, and the witness I had in the room at the time when the senior officer bullied me saw me in Scotland Yard and she came up to me and she burst into tears. She grabbed me, she said, I've got quite a powerful job now. And she said, I've got my own office in the yard. I need to talk to you. Can you come and see me? I said, yeah, I'll come, I'll come. So I went to her office and she just burst into tears. She grabbed hold of me, hugged me, and she said, can you ever forgive me for what happened? And I said, well, what are you on about? She said, I watched them bully you and destroy you and everything you said happened. That little girl died. I said, oh, yeah, I know about that. She said, and since you did what you did, they never investigated another case of child prostitution. And that was 2004, 2005. They never investigated another case. So nearly 10 years of all those serious, serious crimes. I mean, you're talking raping of children, just short of murder, really. In seriousness, they never investigated another, another. I mean, they, they even had a transgender crime unit. And transgender crime it, it equated for like 0.001% of all... So there was a team investigating that, but child prostitution, there was nothing, nothing, nothing. And she said, everything you said was right. I left the unit because of how they treated you. Please, please forgive me. Right. So they never, never touched it after that. John, you, you are in, still in a delicate situation with the police. So uh, I'll say that we'll, we'll just end that yeah. bit there on your relationship and how, how things are going for leaving yeah. the police. Just to finish, give us some. Um, what What is your opinion of of what you've uncovered? What What is going on? Well, well funny enough, I, I was asked this when when I was interviewed as a witness, and they said, "Why do you think they did this?" And I said, "Well, because they're involved. There There is a cover up, and these people are appointed into these key positions where they have total governance of all these allegations." So they can't be dealt with by any other unit other than the specialist unit. So there's like a filter they go through. And then internally in this unit, they will be filtered again. What gets preceded with and what doesn't. So that they have total autonomy on what they deal with and what, what they don't deal with. So these people are put in place to make sure these allegations don't get out. And it's not just that. All them years that I worked um, in, in this remit, we would get what they call referrals. Now referrals could come from schools, Referrals could come from playgroups, from wherever. And all the years I worked on, on child abuse investigations, I was aware of only once a referral coming through from NSPCC. Only once. Now, bear in mind, they've got Childline, and all them kids that will be ringing up Childline, especially when Jimmy Savile got nicked and everything else, why didn't they ever come through? Why didn't they ever come through? And these people are filters. And my opinion is they, they are filters that, that these people are deliberately put in there to protect those that are involved, deliberately. John, thank, thank you very much for right. having the courage to uh, come and talk us through that. And I'm, I am very, very sure that uh, the people that listen in to this interview will not only be shocked at what you've said, but they will also be putting together information in their minds because, of course, you've taken us through those experiences. And what have we seen? We've seen more and more of this coming up to the surface in the public uh, press and media, all then dis dismissed, and it's all suppressed. It all drifts away into the long grass. And you are one of, we now know, a number of officers who've had the courage to stand up and say, no, this is real, it's going on and you've paid a pretty heavy price for it. So I'm going to say I think this will really get people thinking, and thank you very much for having the no. courage to talk. No, that's quite right. I mean, all I will say is people have come forward, but they've always got retired before their name. Retired before their name. What a statement for John to come forward with the police officers who dare to stand up and expose the cover-up of child abuse are bullied, harassed, and retired against the background of child abuse which we are seeing across the country whether it's Holly Gregg in Scotland whether it's Rotherham whether it uh, is Melanie Shaw with the Beechwood Nottingham abuse Mickey Summers another name there across the country we are seeing time and time again 
child abuse survivors coming forward and telling their story. And now, with the help of John Walker, we can really get to understand that the people covering up this abuse are the highest, are people in the highest echelons of society. They are the members of parliament, they're the lords, they're the senior police officers, they are the establishment figures. And as we have heard, worst of all perhaps, they are some of the very charities that say they are there to protect children. One current case that uh, provides a background to all of the things that John has been talking about must be the Brian and Janice Doherty case. Uh, you can listen to the interviews with this uh, mum and dad on UK Column website, but this is the story of parents whose only crime, if I can call it that, is to report that a man tried to buy their son for sex. And when they report that incident to the police in Scotland, they become the criminals, they become hunted by social services, and ultimately they are the parents who have four children taken from them uh, by armed Garda police in Ireland. There can only be one explanation for how that was possible, and that is that there is, as John says, a conspiracy at the highest levels to protect those who abuse children, and in particular to protect those at the highest levels of society.